So today, welcome all of you here joining this webinar of the Hong Kong Business University. Uh, the admissions office uh, organized this monthly webinar to gather uh, a lot of professors from the Hong Kong Business University to share with you uh, their knowledge and also their working experience and then also their uh, research in HKBU. And then today, uh, we have invited Dr. Long from the Hong Kong Baptist University Department of Chemistry, uh, who has been working on the cancer or molecular biology areas for over 20 years. And today, Dr. Long is going to share his drug discovery journey to all of you. And then shall we welcome Dr. Long uh, sharing his uh, research experience over here. So let's welcome Dr. Long. Thanks a lot, uh, Crystal, for your kind introduction. Uh, and I'm, welcome everyone, uh, high student fellows and, uh, and the parents uh, who are interested to join this uh, seminar. It's really my great pleasure to, uh, uh, to let me to introduce you uh, our, with some of our research work uh, that uh, we, we've done recently. So let me um, share the screen with you. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, as an assistant professor um, um, in the Department of Chemistry, uh, yes, my name is Unlock. So uh, besides teaching, right, I have 15% role in teaching and 50% to do research. And only for per performing research, we can generate uh, new ideas and new knowledges. And that is, that is one of the objective of, uh, uh, of the academic staff uh, working at universities. And today I would like to show you how basic science can be translated to drug discovery. And uh, it is an early phase development of diagnostic inhibitors for EBV associated malignancies. So before I'm going to, uh, to show you um, our actual research uh, results, um, I'm going to talk maybe something um, more general. It's how a drug uh, is developed. And uh, by definition, the drug development is the process of bringing a new pharma pharmaceutical uh, drug to the market. And the process include mainly, okay, there are two processes, the preclinical and the clinical, right? So um, in the next slide, I'm going to show you the, the actual um, uh, procedures involving the clinical and clinical uh, sciences. Uh, but as you can imagine, or you have heard of some authority such as the United States uh, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, um, they, they are the, uh, the parties that are uh, uh, which responsible to grant the approval for a new compound, right, to determine whether the new compound uh, can be used for human trials, okay. And Dr. Long, maybe you have to uh, share your slide as well because we cannot see the slide right now. Oh. Maybe you have to play it. I mean, uh, make it through screen so that we could uh, see your slide clearly and then oh, see the okay. contents. Yes, right. Is it okay, okay now? We can see that oh. right now. Thank okay. you. Sorry, I didn't notice that. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so, um, about uh, uh, the uh, FDA I just talked about, uh, there's a process called IND, it's investigational uh, new drug. And this is a process that they will um, uh, assess the clinical data because before uh, the drug can be going for human trials, they have, to be, they have to make sure whether the drug is safe, okay? The most important issue is the safety, right? Whether there's any toxicity, generated by the uh, candidate compound, okay? So IND is one of the important process. And once the drug can go through the clinical trials, okay, we go through a series of different trials I'm going to talk about. Uh, 
if successfully, okay, or lucky enough, you can, if, if successfully to go through all the different trials, I mean, eventually, whether the, the drug can be approved and can be launched to the, to the market, it has to go through a pro, another process called new drug application or NDA. Okay, this is also uh, governed by the uh, uh, FDA or uh, equivalent uh, uh, party to uh, determine uh, uh, whether the new drug can be launched to the market. And for, I mean, in theory, everyone, everyone can, can use the new drug after the NDA. So this table, right, we'll show you the, the general idea of different phases of drug development. Okay, so the okay. So the first stage is drug discovery stage. Right? It mainly involves uh, the basic science research conducted in universities. Okay, so including myself, uh, I think more than fifty part of my work is drug discovery phase. Okay, so mainly the university. Uh, professors or uh, investigators, they, they are involved in, in, in this is so-called basic science, okay? So the aim is to uh, identify the drug target. Okay. And the drug target is, all, is usually identified by the understanding of the molecular mechanism which causes the disease, okay? And by understanding the molecular mechanism, they aim to uh, identify the key component which is responsible for the disease causing process. Right? And that component for most of the time is, is a protein, okay? The protein, the key protein, right? Is aimed to identify as the cancer causing process. So once the key protein is identified, scientists can then uh, make the uh, inhibitor, okay? to inhibit that key protein. So in theory, after the inhibition of the protein, the disease causing process will be inhibited, right? So the disease status will be, revert, will be reverted, okay? So this is the drug discovery process, okay? Um, and it, it's mainly about the, the proof of concept, right? Whether the inhibition of a particular uh, um, Molecular process is responsible for the disease state, for the disease status, and um, uh, so uh, this is the first stage. Okay, and after the, the drug target is identified, we go to the second stage, which is the preclinical uh, studies, and that will involve two steps. Okay, the first step is the quality quality check of the new candidate compound, right, the QC check. But in drug development, the QC check is not called, is, is not called QC, it's called CMC, okay. CMC represents chemical manufacturing and control, okay. So what what is doing here is uh, the purity, the stability, and the yield of the new candidate compound will be determined, okay. And this is very important because we aim to make it a, a pure compound, okay, with, with least impurities. Because those, those impurities will uh, elicit some negative effect, maybe uh, uh, that will uh, uh, contribute to your toxicity of the new uh, candidate compound. So the QC is very important, right? So once you go through the QC, your purity is okay. The yields okay, okay, and you show that your compound is stable. Then we go to the second step: is the clinical studies. Okay. But the, the clinical study that mainly involve the use of cell models, right? or more importantly, uh, animal models that we test whether your drug is effective right, to cure a certain disease, and more importantly, is is the safety of the new candidates. Okay, so we will use lots of animals right, to test your compound, okay, for the drug efficacy and the toxicity. And once those 
you, you got the good result, okay, with high efficacy and low toxicity, right? Then you will be able to get the approval of IND that I just mentioned in, in the uh, first slide, okay? And only with the approval of IND, the new candidate compound will be subjected to the next phase is the clinical studies, okay? And for clinical studies, right, there are many involved clinicians, right? So there are medical doctors, right? Only the clinicians are authorized, right, to give drug to patients, right? So for this part is mainly conducted in hospitals or uh, clinical research centers. And for the phase one trial, it's mainly involved a small group of volunteers, right, of healthy people. Usually less than 20 people uh, participate in the phase one trial. And the, the major objective of phase one trial is to test whether there will be any adverse side effect of your new compound. Okay. It's not about to test the drug advocacy. So that is, that, that is the reason why only the healthy volunteer are involved in the phase one trial, okay? Then once it shows that your compound is safe for human use, it will go to the second phase. So the second phase will include hundreds of patients, okay? So patients for this time. So the objective of second phase is to test both the safety and the drug efficacy, right? To see whether a drug will be useful to revert the, cancer, uh, the patient status. Right. And at the same time, it also focused on the drug safety, right? To see whether there's any uh, side effect uh, occur. And after the second phase, that will follow by the, the phase three trial. But phase three is include uh, more than thousand of patients, okay? Usually multi-center, right? So multi-hospital will be involved. In the phase one, in the phase three trial, right? The phase three trial, uh, of course, the drug efficacy will be determined, and also because we have large number of patients, right? Only with that large number, we can see all kind of different side effects, okay? Whether it's heavy side effect or light side effect, okay, and be observed in the phase three trial. And once all the criteria right, are fulfilled for the NDA the drug will be commercialized, right? And for this part, it's mainly conducted by the, by the big pharmaceutical companies, right? To synthesize the new compound and to, uh, to sell and market the compound, right? And launch the compound to the market. So this is the general idea of how um, a drug uh, is developed. Okay. So going back, my own research. I'm going to introduce you a virus called EBV, Epstein Barr virus. Okay, so what is it? It's a DNA virus, it's a DNA herpes virus. Why is it spread in human population? You look at this figure, it's so scary. Okay, more than 90% of human population already infected with this virus. Right? So including maybe including you and me, I think for me, I must be infected by this virus, okay? But don't be, don't be too scared because EBV is not as deadly as COVID-19, although the infection rate, incident rate is so high, right? It's not that deadly, it's not that uh, harmful, right? Because for most of the time, uh, we have the intact immune system, to, to suppress the activity of EBV. So this is the reason why we are still safe uh, and live together with EBV. And EBV is one of the first viruses found to be associated with tumor development. As you can see on this uh, circle, it indicates the different types of EBV associated malignancies. And out of those malignancies, there's one cancer type called NPC, right? The full name is nasal pharyngeal carcinoma. And what's so special about this cancer? This cancer is, has the most intimate relationship with EBV. Right? 
it has 100% association with uh, MPC. So that the, uh, the relation is almost absolute, right? which means in all the tumors that are found in the MPC patients, they all carry the EBV virus. So people in the field tend to believe that EBV can function as an oncogenic driver for MPC development. Okay, ah, I forgot, this is a picture of, of an EBV uh, viral particle. Okay, so it looks like a typical uh, virus which contains an alpha right, with the adhesion molecules. And uh, there's a capsule which contains the DNA material inside. So it's a very uh, uh, typical structure of a virus. So um, NPC is derived from the number epithelium in the nasal barracks, right? as indicated in this uh, picture. This is the anatomical location of nasal barracks, right? which is behind the nasal cavity. And it almost in uh, location at, at the middle of the head. Right? And this unique uh, anatomical location make it not very accessible for surgical operation. So the, uh, the first line treatment for MPC patient is radiotherapy because of, of this reason. And besides the, uh, the viral factor, the dietary and genetic factor also play a role in MPC development. And I will show you that in the, the following slides. <clears throat> And MPC is prevalent in southern China regions, including Hong Kong, Guangdong, Guangxi, Fujian. And um, the Cantonese people, they, they are somehow more susceptible to MPC development, right? So, but for, for Chinese, uh, for northern Chinese, MPC is a rare, it's a rare cancer type, okay? So because of that, uh, the people in the field tend to believe that the genetic factor must play a role, right? But up till now, we don't know. We don't, we don't understand exactly which gene in the southern Chinese people, right? We make MPC more prevalent right, in, in those ethnic groups. Right? We, we, we don't have a definite answer yet, but we know the genetic has to play a very important role. And similar to other uh, cancer type, the survival rate in late stage MPC patient is quite poor. For example, for stage four, survival rate is less than 40%, indicating that the current therapy is not very effective for those uh, advanced MPC patients. And uh, as I mentioned, the current golden treatment for MPC is radio with astrophenicy splitting based chemotherapy. But uh, none of those agents is either EBV or MPC specific. Right? So as you can imagine, radiotherapy or chemotherapy can have very adverse side effects. So that will really affect the, uh, the quality of life for those MPC patients receiving the treatment, okay. But sadly, um, in the, uh, I mean, commercially, there's no EBV specific drug. So this is the reason why we tend to, uh, uh, we're trying to make the uh, EBV specific drugs to treat the EBV associated cancer patients. So this is our, our aim for, for this project. And this slide shows you a proposed model of MPC development. So upon chronic exposure to carcinogens, including a chosen release from the salted fish, salted egg, or other form of pickled food, the, uh, the number of bacteria in the nasal pharynx may acquire DNA damage, right? So this is the reason why dietary it's an other risk factor for MPC development, okay? Because, because of those uh, uh, kind of, you know, salted fish, 
that kind of uh, pickle food, they, they will release carcinogen. Okay, so that will increase the incidence of MPC. Uh, if you constantly consume those kind of uh, uh, pickle food. And uh, once chromosome 3P, chromosome 9P DNA division occur, the EPV will be able to infect those damaged tissues. Okay. And the, the EPV will infect this tissue in the latent form. Right? And the benefit of having the EPV latent infection is that the EPV can escape from the immune system. Right? Because the latent infection will minimize the level and the number of EPV proteins. Okay, because the immune system can, can efficiently recognize the viral proteins. So this is the reason why EBV prefer to stay in the latent infection, but not the latent. Right? And after that, the clonal expansion of an EBV infected cell will begin. And more and more genetic alteration, including the gene mutation, will be accumulated in that EBV infected cell. So eventually, the aggressive MPC tumor bulk will be formed. And there are a number of EBV latent proteins. And there's one very important that we think. Okay, it's called EBNA1 or EBNA1. And the full name is EBV nuclear antigen 1. And this protein, just by the name, you can guess it is present in the cell nucleus. Okay. And this protein is the only EBV latent protein expressed in all EBV infected cells. And there must be a reason. The reason is, you look at this diagram, okay? The function of the EPV protein, okay, as indicated by this green uh, color uh, uh, protein, its function is to attach the EPV genome, right, which is circular DNA, to attach the EPV genome with the human chromosome, okay? So it can function to stably maintain the EBV genome in the whole cell. So this is a reason why the abnormal one has to be present in all EBV infected cells because of its function. And furthermore, for abnormal one to function, it has to form a dimer. Okay, so this is two identical monomer units of abnormal one, right? So it's form a dimer. Only with the presence of a dimer, the EBV genome can be attached to the human chromosome, okay? So we can look at this diagram, right? It's a 3D uh, 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 diagram or the X-ray crystal structure diagram of, of an abnormal dimer interacting with the EBV DNA, right? So the one abnormal monomer, it's present in a 3D form. This is one of the abnormal monomer. Okay, this is the other one. Right. So you can see the EBV DNA sits nicely on top of the EBV dimer. Okay. okay. And this is a dimerization interface, okay, which maps to the C terminal end of one abnormal monomer. Okay. And this is our drug target. Okay. And because abnormal one has no human homolog, in other words, there's no human protein which looks like abnormal one. So targeting abnormal one has the advantage that it will minimize the chance of having side effect, right? Because you, when we target abnormal one, we, we will not target the other uh, human cell proteins, okay? So that strategy will not affect the normal cell in theory, okay? So next, this is the strategy of how we are making the anti uh, abnormal one compound. So let's take our compound called L2P4 as an example. Okay. So it contains a peptide, okay, 
Okay, a peptide is a short form of protein, but it just contains less than 10 amino acids. But this peptide can specifically bind with an abnormal monomer. Okay. In addition, we have attached a fluorochrome, which is a small molecule. Okay. And after uptaken of L2P4 in an EBV infected cell, the fluorescent signal will be emitted. Right, because of the presence of the fluorochrome in L2P4, right? And uh, yeah, the reason is because when L2P4 successfully bind to its target protein, which is an abnormal monomer, right, the fluorescent signal will be emitted. So L2P4 can be used to label the EBV infected cell. Right? It can also be used to determine whether uh, uh, the our anti-EBV compound can selectively label the EBV positive cell lines. And we can also trace and visualize right, our anti-EBV compound by looking at the fluorescent signal and to determine whether the compound has gone into the right localization in the cell. And on the other hand, uh, L2P4 can also disrupt the dimer formation of F1. Then the consequence is if dimer formation of F1 is inhibited, F1 can no longer function. Okay. So as a result, uh, the EBV genome can no longer attach to the human chromosome. Right? And the viral genome will be disappeared. So finally, the EBV in better cell will be killed. So as you can see, right, our anti one or anti-EBV agent has dual function. One for imaging, the other function is, is for the therapeutic intervention. Right. So that represents the ideas of diagnostics, okay, as, as both imaging and therapeutic purpose. And diagram on the right, is the experiment that we used to prove that L2P4 can inhibit the dimer formation. And look at this, there are two test tubes. For these test tubes, they only contain the abnormal protein, right? We put the abnormal protein in the buffer, right? The abnormal monomer tends to form dimer in this, um, in this buffer, which mimic the physiological uh, condition. Then we put this, uh, protein preparation onto a protein gel. Okay, we run the protein on the gel, and this is what we can see. We see two bands, two protein bands. One larger band represents the uh, abnormal dimer. And the smaller band represents the monomer, right? Because the smaller molecule, the lower molecular weight can migrate faster on the protein gel, right? And there's the reason why the dimer is on the top, okay? And for the in other test tube, right? Well, after the addition of L2P4, it binds at the terminal end of an F1 monomer. Okay. And by doing that, the dimer cannot be formed. And we put this uh, mixture and run the gel. And this is what we actually observe. Right? The signal of the dimer becomes much darker than the control with the L2P4. Okay, so this is the evidence to show that L2P4 can inhibit the dimer formation of M1. So the M1 function can be described by L2P4. Okay. So um, next, um, I'll show you some, some uh, uh, this is the first generation of uh, abnormal probe, okay? So initially, okay, we, we did that uh, a number of years ago, okay? And we, we, we made two uh, abnormal targeting peptide for P1 and P2, right? And for P1, it contains six amino acids, CYFMVF, and for P2, it contains uh, five amino acids. And they are both conjugated with a small molecule, Right, for emitting the fluorescent signals. In the diagram below, 
uh, is a computational study, right? It's a prediction of how our anti anti one compound can interact with the uh, abnormal one monomer. Okay, so the two first generation compound we made is called JLP one and JLP two. Right? After conjugation with P one and P two. And so, because we contain the uh, the fluorochrome, which can emit a fluorescent signal, so the last window represent this emission spectrum of JLP one and JLP two. Right. So this is some some physical characterization for our uh, new compound. And in the small window, okay, when we put JLP two in a test tube, okay, with buffer, and then we gradually add the abnormal protein to the test tube, and then we measure the fluorescent signals. Okay, so as you can see, the fluorescent intensity increases right, when more abnormal is added to the test tube. Right. So that experiment that indirectly right, to, to show that once L2P, one JLP to interact with abnormal one, the fluorescent signal will be emitted. Okay, or, or, or the other way once you see the fluorescent signal intensity is increased, it represents abnormal one or JLP2 can interact with the abnormal one protein. Okay, so how about in the cell? Because ultimately, we want to see whether the cell can, success, successful, can successfully uptake. Uh, uh, JLP1 or JLP2. So we perform the live imaging using the confocal microscopy. Okay, so we do it in, in a culture dish. Okay, so for each culture dish, we see the, the EBV uh, positive cells, and we see it in other uh, culture dish with the EBV negative cells, and then we added uh, JLP uh, anti EBV compound into the culture medium, okay, because those are tumor cells, but they still need nutrients to grow. So usually for us to culture the, uh, uh, the tumor cell, we have to put them in culture medium, okay. So after uh, a period of time, usually just a few hours, we perform the confocal microscopy to measure the cross signals. So as you can see, for the EBV negative cell lines, the HeLa cell, there's no fluorescent signals at all, okay. In the JLP one, there's no signal. And we only observe the signal emitted from JLP two, right? But those green fluorescent, those green fluorescent signals are the signal emitted from JLP two in the EBB positive cells. So indicating that JLP two can selectively label right, the cell with EBB, right? But cell without EBB, there will be no signals. Okay, at this point, it seems like right, this compound is working, it's working well, okay, you can emit fluorescent signals, okay. However, when we enlarge this image, okay, we look at them more carefully, the green signal localized to the cytoplasm, right, not to the nuclear, right. This is a problem, why is that? Because for well, Abner 1, as I mentioned earlier, this is a nuclear protein. So it should be found in the cell nucleus. Right? But the signal that we observe is not. So it's a problem, right? It's not working that well for the cellular uptake. So this is the reason why we further modify our abnormal targeting peptide with the addition of four amino acids. Okay, it's called an NLS, the nuclear localization. Signaling protein. Okay. And this RRK is further incorporated to the abnormal one targeting peptide at the C terminal N. And this compound is L2P4 that I pre previously showed you uh, uh, before. Okay. So it's conjugated with a small molecule uh, which can emit fluorescent signals. So let's see whether it can help. The nuclear permeability. So this is the result of focal imaging. We perform a similar uh, assay 
by adding L2D4 into the cell culture medium. Okay, we include both EBB negative and positive cell lines. So for the EBB negative cell, we only observe the signals right, emitted in the cytoplasm. Right? So those red fluorescent those signals represent signals emitted from L2D4. Okay. But you cannot see any signal in the nuclear. With the EBB negative cells. And on the other hand, the EBB positive cells, the blue fluorescent this time represent the nuclear dye, right? Just to localize the location of the cell nucleus. But this time you can see some signals emitted in the nuclear. Right? For both C6661 and MPC.3, you see quite obvious nuclear signals emitted. So that means the addition of the NLS. Uh, okay, can then significantly enhance the nuclear permeability of L2D4. So that's good. So what is next? Next we test the anti-tumor activity, right? the anti-tumor growth activity of L2D4. We do similar things we do in the culture dish. Okay, so we add L2D4 the EBB positive cells, right, because <clears throat> only those cells can con contain the, 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 the target protein abnormal one, okay. And in parallel, we also include a solvent control, right? So what's a solvent control? It, con it also contains the EBB positive cells, but we don't add L2B4, we only add the solvent to the cartridge. Okay, we use the same solvent that used to dissolve L2D4. It's a solvent control. And this is very important, right? Because how do we know L2D4 will be effective to suppress the tumor growth? We need something to compare with, okay? So the solvent control is the control without the drug, okay? And we want to test whether the cell number will be different after the treatment with L2D4. But we don't count the cell one by one, right? That would be very silly. Would be very time consuming and tedious. So instead, we perform a standard cell viability assay called MTT. Okay. So very simple assay. We add the dye called MTT. It's a substrate which can uh, infiltrate into the mitochondria in living cells. Okay, all living cell, all cell contain mitochondria. Okay. So the MTT dye can stain all the living cells, okay? And what will happen? So in living cell, the mitochondria will convert the dye into a deep blue dye, okay? So after that, after the, 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 the changing of the, uh, the substrate color, we go to measure the absorbance, okay? So higher the absorption, that represents, represents the, the more the cell numbers. Okay, it's, both, it's proportionally related to the cell numbers, right? So to measure absorbance. So that's why we just measure absorbance, right? We, we, we put the, the culture plate like this, right? Into a plate reader, right? And the plate reader will be able to measure the absorbance of each well. Okay, some well might contain the solvent control, some well might contain your, your, your drug treatment, okay, and then we measure absorbance, okay, and this is the result, I report it in the bar chart, okay, so we also include the EBB negative cells on the top, the three cell lines, they're EBB negative, and we also include the EBB positive cells, okay, so look at the blue, the blue bars, okay, they're the, the, they're the, the treatment that we felt to be for, okay, and the x axis represent the different concentrations, well, the y axis represent the percentage of viable cells. Okay, so 100% means all the cells can survive. 0% means all the cells are dead. Right, very simple. So, on top panel, you see uh, none of the cells are significantly uh, so reduced number of cells. Okay, so a, re a reagent cannot kill the EBV negative cells at all. Right. But Look at the EBV positive cell on the lower panel. You can see the higher dose of L2B4, right, the more cells are killed. Right? So it's dose dependent. Right? It's 
the resistance to this. The more L2 D4, the more cell will be killed by this agent. So this result indicated that L2 D4 can kill the EBB positive cells selectively. Right. And that's good because we don't want L2P4 to affect normal cells. And normal cells don't have EBV. Okay. So at least this result shows that L2P4 fill that kind of criteria. Okay. So of course, we want to test with animals. Okay. This is called vivo. In vivo means animal. Okay. We test. So how do we test? We 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 use an animal and we transplant the MPC tumor, right, uh, in the uh, a subcutaneously transplant MPC tumor into an um, immunocompromised uh, animal, okay. And then we wait until the tumor grow to a certain size, usually around 200 millimeter cube, okay. When we see that kind of size of tumor, we then inject it directly uh, uh, with our drug L2 people into the tumor. Okay, and we perform that kind of drug administration twice a week, and also twice a week we measure the tumor size of the tumor right, to see if it, whether, there, whether there is any change of tumor size. Okay, so in the middle is the result. The x-axis represent the number of days of the treatment, while the y-axis represent the average tumor volume. Okay, so when you compare, you compare the red line. This is the treatment with L2P4. But the blue line is the solvent control. Okay. We also use the solvent control as a reference for, for, for us to compare. Okay. So as you can see, after L2 people treatment, the, the tumor size can be significantly reduced okay, along all the time points. Right? The, the, the change is huge, okay, more than 9% tumor volume reduced. Okay, so this is good. And besides tumor volume, we also measure the body weight of the man animal after receiving our drug, but there's no significant change. Okay, so the body weight is another, the body weight is a parameter which reflect the, uh, the healthiness of the animal. Okay, so this data indicating that uh, L2P4 has the therapeutic potential, right? And it's also very safe to use for animals. And we have also included another model, right? Another tumor model, which uh, transplanted with, with a non-EBV tumor, okay? We do the same thing. We also inject L2P4. It's just tumor, we don't use MPC tumor. We use a, a EBV negative tumor, okay? We, per we perform exactly the same procedure as L2P4. We measure the uh, tumor volume, the body weight, okay? But there's no significant change of the tumor volume. Okay, although it's a tumor cell, the L2 people cannot, cannot uh, uh, affect the tumor volume of EBV negative tumor. Okay, so that shows that EBV, it shows that, no, sorry, L2 people can selectively right, to eradicate EBV positive tumors. There's no effect on the EBV negative tumors. Okay, it's, it's very selective, highly selective against the EBV positive. Uh, uh, cell derived tumor. Okay, so this good. So um, then this picture may look a bit disgusting, but I, I just want to show you the actual uh, uh, observation that, that uh, what happened to the animal. Okay, but this is not the same drug, it's another drug, but it's also anti EBV. This time we delivered the drug by the intravenous intravenous injection, uh, IV injection, okay, because we want to mimic the clinical setting, okay, because in the clinic, the patient received and the chemotherapy treatment uh, by the vein, okay, so there's a reason why we, we, we inject the drug into the tail vein, okay, so the drug will be delivered into the circulation and the tumor will, will receive the, the, our drug by the, the blood circulation, okay. So we administrated five milligrams per kg of our drug into the animal, okay. So uh, there are two animals for this treatment. As you can see, this animal is immunocompromised. You, you see one thing, you, you, <laughs> you notice they have no hair, they're hairless, okay. They are called the mice, right? They, they are immunocompromised. That means their immune system is not intact, 
okay? And um, the reason why is because we don't want the immune system to affect our result. Right? We want to look at whether our drug can, can reduce the tumor size, not due to the, the immune system or the immune response. It, that is the reason why uh, you always see people using that kind of animal model to test for the drug efficacy, okay? And for week one, uh, you see the tumor, they are transplanted, you know, at the flank region of the, uh, of the animal, right? That is subcutaneous transplantation. It's under the skin, right? We put the tumor, we put tumors on the skin, we wait until we go to that kind of size, okay? And then we deliver the drug, right? This week one after the drug treatment, right? There's no significant, significant change of tumor size. But for week three, right, look at that carefully, right? You see some necrotic tissue on top of the tumor, okay? Uh, so the tumor tissue, okay, the tumor tissue decomposed. So this is the reason why it, it, they, they show the necrotic uh, 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 pathology, okay? That's why they turn dark, because the tissue decomposed, okay? And for week five of the treatment, oh, the, oh both, for both tumor collapse. Okay, so the tumor volume reduces a lot. Reduces a lot. Okay. If a week eight, the old tumor are gone. Okay, it's quite successful. Old tumor can be gone after treatment with that dose. Then we further cut down the dose to be two milligram per kg. Okay, similar observation object. Okay, the tumor can be gone in some animal, of course, not all animal. Okay. Uh, in some, will be 30% anyway. We, we can see complete eradication of the tumor. Okay, so that is good. You see our drug is quite useful, okay? At least in some animal models. So um, we have the idea because we, 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 we know there's a market, there's a need for anti-EBV agent, anti-EBV drug. And we also notice that our, our drug is working. Okay, there's a reason why we, we, we have an idea whether we want to commercialize our anti-EBV compound, okay? And the thing is important is we have to get uh, technology protected. So we need to file patent for, for our anti-EBV agent, okay? So in order to do that, we, we have to apply for the patent. And we, we do that through the help of our KTO office and the uh, knowledge transfer office. They help us a lot to uh, apply for the patent because they, they are very professional. They are very professional to do that, right? They give us advice uh, whether our compound or our ideas could enough would be sufficient for, for, for file patent, okay? And also they, they will give us advice of what additional uh, experiments should be performed by the file the patent, that kind of thing. So they are very, very, very helpful. This is just a general flow chart of how Patent application can be uh, performed. Okay, I just follow what they what what what, what they uh, told me to do. Okay, so the patent is critical. Okay, for for commercialization process. And uh, in the year 2018, December, we have established the HKBU spin-off company. It's called BB Inomac. Okay because we decided to commercialize our anti-EBV agent. Right. So the business focus is on the anti, is to make anti-viral agents. Right. And of course we need the financial support at the beginning. And that was supported by the scheme called Tissue. Right. The full name is Technology Startup Support Scheme for Universities. I will explain that in the next slide, I think. And the following slide will be. And we have two founders, including myself, okay. Uh, as introduced by Crystal, I'm a cancer biologist uh, who's been working on MPC for more than 20 years, okay. And I have, we have another co-founder, right, Professor Gary Wong, who, a, who is an expert in lanthanide chemistry, peptide synthesis, and molecular imaging. Right? Basically, he's a chemist, okay. So um, yeah, we are somehow complement to each other's expertise because uh, I'm so familiar with MPC or EBV. Okay, so I identify a lot of MPC, EBV uh, drug targets, but I cannot synthesize 
the drugs okay because i'm not a chemist i i i don't have strong uh, chemistry background but gary has very strong chem chemistry background right and this is the reason why we get together and collaborate he's making the drug that i want to target on and i'm testing this drug on the animal and some others so we are putting we are perfectly matched but just gary and i are not enough to do everything okay we still need some expertise uh, advices from my team of scientific advisors, including the local and uh, international uh, scientists right, in, in different fields, including EPV associated cancer, cancer imaging, uh, the uh, formulation and uh, pharmacokinetics uh, expert, and also yeah, the, the, the drug design and synthesis team. Okay, so it's really a, a uh, this project is, 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 we do it through the collaborative, collaborative effort. Okay, going back to tissue. Okay, so this is a scheme that uh, supporting the startup of our company. Okay, so this scheme was launched in 2014 by the government, ITC, by the Pune's Innovative and Technology Commission. Okay, and this scheme tends to provide financial support to the new startup uh, from the six universities okay, to support the R&D uh, uh, output, okay? <clears throat> so who will be eligible to apply? So all the Hong Kong company, okay, registered in Hong Kong, but not more than two years, right? Those uh, technology startup will be uh, eligible for the application of tissue. And the team members, Okay, um, I think ITC is encouraging the graduate student to, to, to uh, establish startup company. So the team member information is a mix of both the students and professors. Okay, the students including the undergraduate student, postgraduate students, and even alumni. Okay, the professors serve as consultants or advisors to give their technical support and direction of the uh, company. Most important thing is how much they are good to support. So for each year for each startup company, they will receive one point five million dollars. Okay, and they can do a renewal for two years. So in, in total, four point five million Hong Kong dollars will be received for each startup company. Okay, so the money will be just for uh, uh, hiring uh, the scientists and for technical staff and some administrative staff to do the paperwork. And also you can use the money to buy the, the consumables and the equipment to do your research. Okay, so this is how we start up our company. Okay. And we are lucky enough, we also got accepted by other program called Incubar program. Okay, and that is the program uh, launched in the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Okay. And the Incubar program aims to help the medical uh, startup company uh, to execute the R and D uh, research activities. So, it's a four-year program. Okay, we're going to support uh, four areas: the workspace, uh, workspace support, including a lab bench uh, to do the research uh, experiments, and also they also given us the. Um, the office, okay, an office for administration staff to uh, to do the paperwork, right. and also there are different kind of high end, low end, uh, 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 routine uh, uh, equipment in, in the Hong Kong Science Park, okay. So it's quite convenient to use, and also they will try to minimize the uh, the cost of using the equipment, okay. So it's quite supportive. That sense, and importantly, they also support the uh, the business uh, activities. Okay, because they will try to help us to expand our business network. Right? They, they they will try to promote promote us right? to to introduce to introduce us to different uh, financial uh, business partners and also potential investors. Okay, investors are very critical. Okay, because we need uh, financial support from. from uh, different kind of business people. Okay, so uh, the activities including exhibition, business sharing, uh, uh, 
media interview, press release, etc. Uh, will, 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 will be conducted in, in, in by the incubator program. And uh, last but not least, of course, financial support. Okay. Uh, around Hong Kong, six million. Uh, around yeah, Hong Kong dollars, six million will be supported for each uh, technology startup. Okay. So that uh, yeah, that would help for for uh, for hiring people and also to buy consumables and equipment using uh, uh, funding. And once you accepted by the Incubate program, okay, we are automatically uh, uh, eligible to apply for the research talent hub. Right? And this program is for hiring uh, of the research scientists. Okay, so they provide money to hire four research scientists. Okay, so the candidate should have a bachelor degree, master or the PhD degree in science, technology, engineer, engineering, and math or related discipline. Okay, so those graduates can be either local or overseas uh, well recognized institutions. Okay, so this is quite good right? because we really need uh, research talents to help us to execute all those kind of uh, research activities. And for any kind of business related uh, funding, right? by the time you apply, you need to submit a business proposal. Okay, so this is what I submitted for my for my tissue and the incubator uh, application. Okay, so those are the major items that I included, okay, including an executive summary. Okay, this part is, is the hardest part because they only allow you to write one paragraph, right? But you have to include a lot of things, including the nature of your business. Okay. Your current technology, right? Why your technology is better than the current technology, that kind of thing. And you have to also show the market overview, what is the market opportunity for your technology. And also you have to uh, introduce your team members and the, the partners, right, for your business. And uh, of course, you, you, you have to mention that your technology is well protected by the patents, okay? And, the business model, like how you're going to make money. Okay, you have to, so you can imagine, you have to put all of these kind of things in just one single paragraph. You have, you have to be very precise. Okay, you, 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 but in the actual main content, you can elaborate you know, all those kind of items in, in, in the actual main content in the business proposal. Okay, but besides that, I also perform a spot analysis. Okay, SWOT that stands for strength, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats. Okay, so uh, for each item, we divide it into the internal and external factor. Okay, to analyze the all those four components for for our technology and our company. Okay, that kind of thing. I think for any kind of business, you have to do that, that kind of, of uh, analysis. Okay, so that's what I put in. in, in so last but not least is our business model. Okay, so how we could to make money so far, right? So we, we already have some candidate come down. We already gone through the discovery, but the drug discovery phase because we know our drug target, which is Atna one. And we already made some uh, candidate compounds. Okay, you got already test with the cell model and animal and animal models. Okay, in addition, the production of our lead compound or, or of our candidate compound are already optimized. So we, we already have some idea of the purity, uh, the stability and the yield right, of our production. Okay, so we have par partially, you know, to build the CMC requirement. Okay, so uh, for the clinical analysis, we already perform small scale of the drug testing, right, the drug efficacy testing, and also the safety cap testing. Okay, so uh, right now we, 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 we are aiming to do the large scale of the uh, clinical, clinical analysis to validate what we saw in the small scale uh, uh, clinical test. Okay, so our ultimate goal is to put a lead compound, right, to successfully uh, get the approval of the IND Right. So with that approval, we can put our drug into a phase one trial. Okay, so we hope our drug can go through the phase one trial successfully, at least to show that our drug is safe for human use. Okay, so this is our ultimate goal. So by doing that, okay, we will license our technology to the big pharma pharmaceutical company to continue the phase two and the phase three uh, clinical studies. Right. 
and uh, because those those kind of study are, the scale are just too too big for 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 us as a small drug company. So um, yeah, we we have to let them to do the job. Okay, so but by by licensing our uh, technology, we will receive the uh, the benefit okay, in terms of money. Okay, we get money for for them to buy our license. So this is how we're going to make make money from from our business. But we still have a long way to go. Okay, <laughs> uh, at least I predict maybe four to five more years. Okay, for, for the beginning of testing and the validation, that kind of thing. Right. So yeah, thank you a lot for your attention. Right. So uh, your attention is very appreciated. And, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Long, for yeah. your great presentation. And then we learn a lot, lot from your research. And then there are some students asking questions about re research in the okay. Q&A box. Mm -hmm. And then there is a question from Sama that uh, uh, he would like to know that apart from animal testing, are there any ways to test the drug? And then maybe you could share some insights uh yeah i uh, i know uh currently um people are there's some more some models some call the the organoid models okay they they are the fresh tissue that uh are freshly isolated from from the, the cancer patient okay so it's like a 3d model 3d culture model right freshly isolated so uh it's, it's more like the the actual tumor but we culture we also cu we culture that in, in a culture dish and to test the um test the drug right and this is one way you can do okay so if if, if successful uh result from, from that kind of uh 3d culture model uh and if lucky enough the, the patient still survive that 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 will will show some evidence that the, the drug went to work for that particular patient. Okay. This this is the the idea of the precision medicine. Okay, but this is the concept. Uh, but still uh, the actual situation, even in the animal, is, is just more complicated than than, than the visual culture dish condition because there are a lot of things that cannot be, I mean at the moment cannot be included. In, in, in the in the culture, uh, for example, the, the blood capillaries, the blood muscles, the stromal cells, including the immune cells. There are a lot of immune cells in in the tumor bone, and also some supporting cells, the scar coating cells called the uh, fibroblasts. Right, they they also present in, in, in the tumor bone. Okay, and also the different growth factors. Okay, which is uh, present in the circulation of, of, of the animal. That, that that kind of thing really. I mean, at the moment, it right, cannot be mimicked by the uh, cell culture model. And more importantly, it's about the toxicity because there's no very good in visual model to test the toxicity of, of a particular drug. Right? You, you have to use an animal. Uh, for us, I show you a lot of experiments are based on small animals, okay? But this is not enough for testing toxicity, right? For the ID requirement, we have to use the the large animal, including uh, monkeys or dogs, okay, because they are more like humans, okay. For for mice or rats, they the small animals. We cannot represent everything happening in a human being. So yeah, I, I think there is still a gap, okay, between the visual and the, and the animal test. Yeah. So great to know that. Thank you for your answer. And then uh, there is also a question from the audience asking mm. about. Uh, what is the major difference between doing research in a lab and also doing startup in the market? Is there any challenge for you comparing these two tasks? Yeah, uh, they're interrelated, okay. Uh, but there are also some different aspects because for academic uh, working in universities, okay, we, we aim for showing something novel, something new, okay. Uh, yeah, it's always about novelty because we, we want to publish our discovery in high high impact journals. Okay, and not the novelty is, is is a top priority. Okay, our everything, right? But uh, but 
but when you're talking about commercialization, how to move your drug, you know, whether you can sell your compound, uh, it, it might be a new like, idea or not a new idea. Okay, it doesn't really matter. The thing is, you you, you just want to see your your, your drug going to work. So so it's more practical. I mean, in 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 in, in doing business, it, it's just not about novelty, right? because something. You no, know, for, for publication, it, it might seem very novel, but but can can the idea uh, easily apply in the actual clinical uh, setting? Is is a, it's a whole different story because the clinician may prefer something simpler. Okay, so uh, this this is a different idea. We 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 have to test uh, our drug. Although we also do the thing in 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 the uh, laboratory, but. For, for working in, in, in the drug companies is, is yeah, somehow this is a di the different aspects. You, you, you have to make sure the, the, the drug going to work, okay? And uh, uh, other thing is uh, for basic scientists, we, we only concern about the, the research work, okay? And that, that's it, <laughs> very simple-minded. But uh, for drug company, uh, the, the R&D part is just one of the, one of the uh, uh, Department in, in in a drug company, but you all we you also need the the support of other departments. Okay, for, for example, the finance department, we, we need someone to do to take care of the, the finance of, of the company, and also we need someone to to do the business. Okay, to to uh, to get engaged with the uh, potential investors. Okay, you have to talk to them. They, they are not scientists. Okay, but you you you. We need someone to com can communicate with them, with those maybe the, the, the businessmen, okay, to, to explain our idea, to explain how our, our work and our trouble to work, that kind of thing. So uh, it's, it's, it, it's, yeah, it, there's more and more things that we have to take care of for, for running a, a drug company. So thank you. So, yeah, thank you know. for sharing it about the difference between the two tasks that mm -hmm. you are doing. And then hopefully students are inspired by you. Maybe later on they will take part in your research as well or joining HABU to be scientists or <laughs> having their own startup company later on sure. in our university. So thank you, Dr. Long. And then maybe uh, we can move on to the next part to share with you a bit more about the uh, admissions requirements and a bit more about the Hong Kong Baptist University. It will just take you around uh, around seven minutes of time hearing me introducing the Hong Kong Baptist University to you. So just a moment that I would like to share my screen first. And then uh, just to let all of you see the screen, hopefully you can see the screen right now, right? And about our university, we would like to tell you a bit more about Hong Kong as well. So if you have never been to Hong Kong before, uh, you will see Hong Kong as a very vibrant city. You can see from this picture, we have a lot of tall buildings. Actually, within those tall buildings, there are a lot of workers working in the business sector, in the scientific sector or other sector. And then people here are walking fast and speak very fast. And then we have the world's most competitiveness economies, one of the world's most competitiveness economies. And apart from that, we rank number six in the uh, Global Talent Competitiveness Index, which means that Hong Kong is a place for nurturing future talents. And that uh, follow up with that, Hong Kong is also a city with a different side, with a very, very beautiful side as well. When you take, for example, 15 to 30 minutes ride, you could travel to one of our hiking trails, and then you can see the, this gorgeous uh, mountain view and sea view within our city. And then apart from that, we are also a good uh, place for you to enjoy gorgeous food because we have a uh, Eastern and Western culture within our city. So we have a very, very good mixture of culture and food and restaurant in Hong Kong. And then if you're interested in studying in Hong Kong, I would also like to introduce a bit more about the Hong Kong Baptist University to you. And then a lot of you might wonder, do you have 
to be have a certain religious belief in order to study in the Hong Kong Baptist University? I can tell you the answer no, because we welcome all kinds of students. We welcome students with different nationality and different religious background. And then most importantly, uh, the uh, medium of instruction in the university will be in English. So you could, will be taught in English and then you could do all your assignments and projects in English. And in our university, we have over 7,000 undergraduate students here. And then we have around uh, 730 plus full-time faculty and teaching staff and Dr. Long will be one of them. And then uh, they will be here teaching you different knowledge and also be your friends. And then if you need future career consultation, they could be your advisor as well. And then in terms of the um, types of program that are offered by our university, you may take a look to this uh, structure of our university. Uh, we have seven faculties of school in our university. We have faculty of arts, uh, school of business, school of Chinese medicine, school of communication, faculty of science and faculty of social science. And then lastly, we have academy of visual arts. So among these faculties and schools, we offer different types of programs and major to you. And then today, because of the time limit, I'm not going to explain to you each of the program, but then if you want to see the full list of program, you may scan the QR code in the slide, and then you can visit our website. Uh, I think you are advised to uh, visit our website later on, maybe in late September for the most updated program list. So that at that time, you can see which uh, major that you like to study are uh, there uh, it's that major available in our university. And then in the next part, apart from the um, academic side, we also encourage our students to join a lot of different activities. Uh, we have a lot of student society in our campus, and then we also encourage our students to go outside our campus to do surface learning and to do exchange program overseas. And then we have over 350 plus exchange partners uh, with our university that you could go to, for example, USA, Canada, or other countries for an exchange program, even during your undergraduate study period. And then in the next part, uh, apart from uh, doing academic uh, learning and also uh, a lot of uh, activities, we also have a lot of career planning support to our students. So you may uh, take a look to this slide and you can see we provide career support, we provide counseling service, and we offer internship opportunities to students while you are uh, during your undergraduate study period. And then finally, we have over 90% of our students go directly into employment after graduate or go for further studies. And then these statistics show you that you could get a good job after you graduate from our university and probably pursue future, for example, PhD or master degree uh, in HKBU or other universities as well. And then here you are a, a bit more about uh, practical information about the admissions requirements and then how are you going to apply to us. Uh, for HKBU, we have three parts of admissions requirements. And the first part would be uh, university entrance requirements, and the second part will be English requirements, and the third part will be program specific requirements. And in the next video slide, I'm going to explain a bit more about that. For the first part, it's uh, university entrance requirements. So here we list out some of the common international qualifications that we accept. Uh, first, we accept IB diploma, we accept GCA level, we accept SAT, and you may reference your score listed here. But in, if in case you're not studying these curriculum, no worry about that because you could uh, find uh, other curriculums that we accept uh, in our website by scanning the QR code. For example, we also accept a curriculum in Malaysia, in Kazakhstan, in a lot of different places in the world. And then move on to the next part. The second part would be the English language requirements. So. Uh, the English language requirements listed here are only part of the requirements that we accept. Again, you can look into our website for the full list of English requirements. But in general, you only have to fulfill either one of these requirements. Take an example, if you score 6.0 in IELTS, you do not have to take the other test, and then you already fulfill our English requirements. 
And then uh, we also have the third part of requirements would be program specific requirements, uh, which we have certain Chinese requirements and certain uh, subject requirements, for example, biology, chemistry requirements for Chinese medicine program. And finally, portfolio submission requirements for, for example, for arts or film major. But then for those, um, specific requirements, you may refer to our website, but in general, if you're interested in science or business, uh, for those major programs, there are no any uh, Chinese or uh, subject requirements for your application. And then I know that here we have a lot of different students. If you are in grade 12, you may aim for this timeline over here. We'll start our application in early next month, the 4th of October, and then we'll have our early round end in November and the main round end in January next year. And then we also have an extended round, which will end in May next year. And then we always encourage students to apply earlier because the earlier that you apply, the uh, higher chance that you can receive scholarship or admissions offer from us. And then here comes to the most important questions, how you can apply to us. So it's quite easy. You do not have to send any hard copy documents to us. You only have to fill in an online application form and upload all the supporting documents to the website. And then you could make two program choices in the form. And then later on, after you submit your application, you'll be invited for interview. And then later on, if you uh, are met, admitted by our university, you'll receive a conditional or a confirmed offer. And one more reminder for all of you that uh, we do not require a separate application for scholarship. That's mean that uh, once you submit your application to us, you will be considered for scholarship as well. And then here comes the most important information for all of you. If you're concerning the budget of studying in our university, you may reference to this slide. Uh, it costs you around 18,000 US dollars to study in HKBU for one year. And that we also have hall in our university. And if you add up hall expenses and personal expenses, it would cost you around 25,000 US dollar per year to study in our university, which is a very, very uh, reasonable price for you to study in a university in Hong Kong compared to what you have to pay in UK or US. And then we also offer scholarship to students who are doing well in their uh, examination. We have full scholarship for students who are doing really well, but then if you are uh, not doing the excellence, but then you could still have a chance to receive tuition fee waiver, half scholarship or one-off scholarship from us. And then most of the scholarship will assess based on your academic performance. And then also a part would be based on your interview performance and your portfolio. And then I think that's pretty much I would like to share with all of you today about the admissions requirements. And then if you have any questions, feel free to type in the chat box as well. And then if you do not have any questions or if you are still thinking, uh, what questions do you have? Feel free to drop down this email address, aldirect at hkbu.edu.hk. And then after this webinar, if you have further questions, feel free to email us and then we will help you with all the questions while you're applying to us. And then again, thank you for Dr. Long joining us today. I think the time is really running out, but then I'm going to stay in this room to answer your questions if any, but then again, once again, I would like to thank you Dr. Long for joining us today. Oh, thank thanks, so Crystal. Much. Yeah, thank you everyone for your attention. I, 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 I was just trying to answer every single question, but if you still have some, question about the, um, our research, you, you can send me an email. Uh, you, you're more than welcome to do so. Yeah. I'm very happy <laughs> to answer all your questions. Yeah. So maybe later on, I could help to collect your contact and then if any yeah. student is asking questions, we could uh, share your contact with them. Okay, thanks a lot, Krista. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. And then maybe I couldn't see any questions about the admissions. Okay, so I just see a few questions about that. Maybe I could answer one or two. And then one of the students is asking about, uh, do you accept students uh, in grade 11? And then I can answer you that uh, we prefer students to have complete their secondary degree, uh, sorry, secondary education. 
and then probably you have to take certain examination, uh, including the one that I listed in my slide for uh, applying to us. So uh, make sure that you finish your secondary education and also uh, fulfilling those, either one of those requirements before you applying to us. And then maybe I could answer one more question about the uh, students I'm asking about uh, again, whether uh, you have to apply separately for scholarship. Uh, once again, I would like to tell all of you that uh, you do not have to uh, apply for scholarship separately. And then you just have to submit your application. And once again, reminding all of you, our application will open on the 4th of October, 2021. And then take this two weeks of time to prepare your application. And then we're looking forward to receive your application as well. So thank you all of you. We wish you have a nice evening and then have a nice uh, day. And then thank you all of you. And then goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.